Do you need to find the skills to How would you tell people that this person? You first, first, first. How would you tell this Well, I don't know. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today I'm going to be talking about the newish president of the Institute for Creation Research, ICR, Dr. Randy Galuzzo. No idea if I'm pronouncing that right. Randy is a bit controversial, even among other young Earth creationists, because he says not only that natural selection isn't sufficient to explain evolution, but that it doesn't exist at all. You may not be surprised to hear this, but basically no one outside of ICR agrees with him. He's giving a talk here, I think in a church, but it doesn't really matter. I'm skipping past the intro bit, and here we go. What's the take home message from Dr. Clary's talk? There's, a, there's, there's several. This is presumably a reference to an earlier talk. I'm including it for context. But if you were to come up to one person and say, I know, I know of a research institution that is doing some research that nobody else on the planet is doing. No secular, no creationist group, none of them. They're taking borehole logs from where? All over the world by the thousands, and they are cataloging the layers that you see. I'd point out that that's fine, but it's not like in most places the geology is unstudied. Look up a stratigraphic map of any location. It's usually pretty detailed. Granted, there are areas where less work has been done than others, but I'm not sure if Dr. Galuza is trying to imply that this work is revolutionary. If he is, it sure doesn't sound like it. And what do we find? We find evidence of a global flood because we find the same layers on how many continents? All of them in the same order. But are they flood layers? Because it's not really super hard to tell if rock was deposited by a flood. For instance, if it's windborne sand, then the answer is no. And we have such sandstone layers across the globe. The reason for the consistent ordering in many places is simple. Supercontinents. Explain that. I feel like I just did. So what Dr. Cleary is putting together is he, he's, not just, he's not just pushing back against evolution. What Dr. Cleary is doing, he's giving you a better explanation to pull a bunch of observations together into a narrative that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, as long as you don't think about it for more than like 30 seconds. That is really, really good evidence for a catastrophic worldwide flood wrong that happened recently no and happened rapidly not even close now we've been really lacking in biology we don't have a unifying narrative interestingly this seems to tie into icr's recent logo change they used to use a stylized depiction of the bohr model of the atom and they were focused mainly on physical sciences like geology and nuclear physics here's what dr galuza had to say about it ICR's most pressing assignment is to fundamentally change the way that people understand biology. Our task is to construct a completely new theory of biological design that incorporates recent discoveries and respects the biblical narrative. The theory would explain hundreds of fascinating examples of creatures' abilities, and from an organism-centered, engineering-based perspective, that gives glory to the creator, and not to nature. We hope this theory will become the fundamental design-based principle uniting biological explanations in Christian textbooks and museums educating future generations of young believers. We pray that an engineering-based approach to biology will spark a second creationist revival and once again stir up a sense of certainty in Christian truth. So basically, Randy's big goal is to once and for all figure out biology without evolution, which, good luck with that. We've been doing a lot of hole punching in evolution for a long time, but we haven't come up with our own explanation of how things in biology are actually working. I'm not aware of any actual problems in evolution that were first proposed by post lng White creationists. And I put the caveat in there that because she and the Seventh-day Adventists rather invented young earth creationism, and then people like Duane T. Gish and Henry Morris ran with it, creating the ICR in the first place, and from there it spawned other organizations and ministries like Creation Ministries International and Answers in Genesis, etc., creationists, as we might now call them, in the 19th century largely died out during the 20th century, and the current crop reject most of their ideas, such as progressive creation and the gap theory, etc. And I hate to say a lot of our hole punching in evolution hasn't really been effective. Well, that's the understatement of the year. In fact, I hate to say our pushback against evolution has been we accept your evolutionary narrative, it just can't do everything you claim. 
I will say, it is abusing the degree to which modern creationism has been backed into the corner of accepting virtually every basic fact about evolution, because they're all so obviously true. That has, been the, that has been the extent of our pushback. Everything you're saying is right about how evolution works, except it just can't do everything you say it can do. Now, is that really a good pushback? Rhetorically, no, but it does have the advantage of not being completely wrong. It's a terrible pushback. When you, when, you guarantee, when, you, when you give away the evolutionary narrative, what you're saying, the mutations happen. Okay, if he goes for mutations don't happen, that'll be amazing since scientists can watch mutations happen and record them. This isn't a question. What you're saying is nature is some mystical selector which can favor some and disfavor others. Nope, no one is saying that. Nature is more like a sieve. It exists and retains some things while letting other things simply get weeded out without any intentionality. If it's too big to fit through the holes, it stays. If not, it's gone. Now granted, the sieve itself was designed by someone, and that person probably had some design criteria in mind. But the important thing is that no one thinks that the actual sieve itself was selecting what will remain in it. And honestly, if you want to just say that the designer of the sieve is analogous to God, then sure, I don't really care. In other words, nature is really crafting life, but it can't just craft it as much as you say it can craft. You know what they say? Checkmate. Basically, yeah, creationists have never made headway in biology. In fact, most of what they say that contradicts biology could be shown to be nonsense with little more than an introductory biology course for undergrads. What we're saying is, you're wrong on everything. Your narrative is wrong from the beginning. That's a bold strategy, Randy. Let's see if it pays off. Your narrative is wrong. That's where our, that's where our new evidence is coming in. Mutations aren't the mechanism, and we are going to flat out totally reject once and for all all personifications of nature where you roll in a bunch of magic into your biology because you have to come up with a substitute creator because you don't want to have and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, couple things here. First, anytime I catch Randy personifying anything he doesn't think is personal, I now get to call it out. Because frankly, personification is just a basic aspect of human communication. If I look at a cloud and I say, I wonder if it'll decide to rain, I'm not actually thinking the cloud has a mind, it's just that since most of what I communicate with has minds, it's an easy way to talk. As if things I do not think have minds do. Second, there are plenty of evolutionary biologists who are Christians. This is not a fight between Jesus and the forces of darkness. And so when you personify nature, when you project onto nature this selective ability, you are projecting onto nature intelligence and volition. No, you're not. Let's look at how a few places define natural selection. Google defines it as the process whereby organisms better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. The theory of its action it was first fully expounded by Charles Darwin and is now believed to be the main process that brings about evolution. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there. Dictionary.com says it's, quote, the process by which forms of life, having traits that better enable them to adapt to specific environmental pressures, as predators, change in climate, or competition for food or mates, will tend to survive and reproduce in greater numbers than those of other kinds, thus ensuring the perpetuation of those favorable traits in succeeding generations. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there. The American Museum of Natural History says this, quote, In its essence, it is a simple statement about rates of reproduction and mortality. Those individuals who happen to be the best suited to an environment survive and reproduce most successfully, producing many similarly well-adapted descendants. After numerous breeding cycles, the better adapted dominate. Nature has filtered out poorly suited individuals and the population has evolved. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there. Wikipedia says that, quote, natural selection is the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to differences in phenotype. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there either. OpenStax, a free open college textbook resource, in their second edition biology text refers to it as, quote, reproduction of individuals with favorable genetic traits that survive environmental change because of those traits leading to evolutionary change. No implication of volition or intelligence on the part of nature there. So basically, whether it be in a dictionary, a textbook, or an encyclopedia, everyone agrees that it is simply a matter of differential reproductive success and that no particular volition or intelligence is needed. Is that not what it takes to make a selection? Yes, it takes intelligence and a will to make a selection. And I'm sorry that things are poorly named in science, but guess what? Up quarks aren't higher than down quarks. Dark energy isn't black, and the peacock mantis shrimp isn't a peacock, a mantis, or a shrimp. Dinosaurs aren't lizards. 
and apparently not every member of Homo sapiens can actually think as the name implies. I don't know what to tell you except that using argument from etymology is to strawman your intellectual opponents. Don't you exercise intelligence and volition when you make a selection? Yep, and congratulations, you found where the selection analogy breaks down. Because all analogies must at some point. That doesn't really mean anything though. So when I project it onto nature, I am projecting onto nature godlike abilities. Yes, and the easy solution that everyone else figured out over a century ago is to just not do that. And since nature is operating everywhere, and as Darwin says, nature is scrutinizing every creature all the time, saving those things which are good, selecting those, and building with them, you have just projected onto nature agency. I mean, yeah, because agency isn't the same thing as personhood, volition, or intelligence. Unintelligent, impersonal agents do things all the time. The hot water scalded Teddy. What's the agent in that sentence? Well, it's the hot water. What did it do? It scalded. Who is the patient? Well, it's Teddy. Grammatically, we English speakers encode agents with the subject role. So anytime you use a noun referring to something that isn't a person as the subject of a verb, you're allowing impersonal things to be agents. Now, in case you're wondering, no, we're not going to get into ergativity or tripartite alignment. And if that makes no sense to you, then don't worry about it. Your life will probably be simpler without trying to make sense of that stuff. Godlike agency. And it is flat out idolatrous. Even if that were happening, since in most versions of Christian theology, God is directly sustaining the world, the acts of nature remain acts of God, even if the two are still distinguishable. So from the perspective of us here in the natural world, if there's a God, we actually should expect nature to act in some ways as if it has volition. So even if we pretend that natural selection gives nature godlike power in the Abrahamic sense of God, that's not a contradiction nor is it necessarily blasphemous. I mean, think about a Christian farmer praying for rain. If it comes and he ascribes that action to God, even though we can all see the meteorology and it looks perfectly normal, do we say that farmer is being blasphemous? I don't know anyone who would say that. We're going to show you, that's right, it is. It's out, it's out. How the Lord Jesus Christ built into these creatures abilities right from the very beginning right from the very beginning, to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. This is what he wanted them to do. Now that will be interesting. So, we have a model, and we're going to go through this here. The screen is intentionally black, because it's quiz time. Quiz time, quiz time. Yesterday, I know, I recognize the faces, so I know you were here. <laughs> um, uh, I said there was the most important part of my lecture. I want you to stop seeing creatures as what? Um, part of nature? I don't know. I wasn't here last time. Oh, so all of those of you who practice your lip bleeding said, he just said, passive modeling clay. Well, that's not how I'd have described things. So I guess mission accomplished on this one? I want you to stop seeing creatures as passive modeling clay being shaped by what? nature, nature, and I want you to see them as active, problem-solving entities which take on environmental challenges, solve them, and fill the earth. I'm not sure that these things are mutually exclusive. I mean, we know that many organisms can solve problems, and depending on your definition, it might be most or all. In order to take on those challenges, creatures must track the environment. The environment changes. The environment doesn't cause them. It detects, oops, I give it away. It detects the change and it, it self-adjusts. Well, that's just phenotypic plasticity. Organisms with the same genome can end up with different traits as a result of their environment. All you need to do to see this is look at identical twins with different upbringings. They are usually not identical. They can vary significantly in height, build, and weight. This isn't news to biologists, nor is it something that's ignored. Therefore, in order to do that, all adaptable things must have three and key elements. Those elements are what? To detect, you must have a sensor. You know what evolutionists call them? Receptors. Hmm, why do they call them receptors? Because they physically receive chemicals, so as to signal the presence of those chemicals to the cell on which the receptor sits. But let's hear the conspiracy theory version of this ordinary explanation. 
because they see organisms as what? Passive. Yeah, every biologist looks at a cheetah chasing down a gazelle and thinks that's the height of passivity. But what they really are is they're active sensors. On a macroscopic scale, some things are active sensors, like the chemoreception, aka smell organs, of tetrapods, which have to have air within transcends actively brought to them in most cases, or samples of the aromatics in the air taken with the tongue and brought to the sensors in the case of monitor lizards and snakes. But the actual proteins on the cells that detect the scents are still passive receptors. It's not as if simple organisms are either actively or passively sensing their environment. In many cases, it's both. Next, they must have what? Innate logic, if then logic. If you detect this, then deploy this, and they have to have output responses. Well, yes and no. They need to have that to actually react to the stimuli, but there's no reason an organism couldn't happen to have a receptor that coincidentally interacts with more than one type of molecule, and so inappropriately react to one, or one that breaks and fails to react. Let's take sweetness. Many animals, humans included, find that common antifreeze used in cars tastes sweet, and so many of them will drink it if given the opportunity. This stuff is also extremely toxic and can kill many organisms in doses far smaller than what those animals typically drink. On the other hand, felines can't taste sweet at all, and simply fail to react to sweet things. That's why a dog will be very happy to eat some sugar. A cat simply doesn't see the point. But cats still have the basic sensory apparatus for tasting sweet things, such as a tongue with taste buds. All right, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to bring about a highly engineered with multiple parts working together for a purpose to talk about creatures engineered adaptability. Creatures engineered adaptability. So here, Randy is being fairly ambiguous. Does that mean that phenotypic plasticity can explain some adaptation to new environments seen in organisms? Because that's not controversial at all. But he might mean something far more significant. You see, ICR, like Ken Ham and basically all other creationists, realized that for the story of Noah's Ark to make any sense at all, without the Ark being bigger on the inside than the outside, that there needs to be a way to reduce the number of animals on the Ark to far fewer than two or seven of each extant species, depending on whether they're clean animals or not. To do this, creationists usually say that the kind referred to in Genesis is not a species, but rather it's a larger group of animals. They usually put this at about the Linnaean rank of family. Now this in itself is odd, as family is an arbitrary rank that doesn't mean anything. A family of beetles is a far different thing than a family of birds, which in turn is a far different thing than a family of mammals. And even within these groups, there's no way to say that the family Giraffidae and Cercopithecidae are of the same level. But nonetheless, creationists find it plausible to think that these arbitrarily extensive groupings of organisms that humans invented for their own convenience, and for no reason at all, rank the same, are actually a real part of nature. But for this to be true, that means that animals like the tiger and the snow leopard had to evolve from the ancestral cat, and that animals like the African elephant and the woolly mammoth did too. But the problem here is that we have genomes for many such animals, and it's not just phenotypic plasticity. You could raise a tiger cub like a snow leopard cub, I promise you won't get a snow leopard at the end of that process. Similarly, I don't care how cold an enclosure you keep an African elephant calf in. It won't grow into a woolly mammoth. And we know that this is because the plasticity doesn't go far enough. Some of these differences, most in fact, are genetic. So if Randy is going to claim that his no natural selection regime of organisms actively adapting to the environment can explain that kind of difference between species, he's going to have to show how, when, and in which cells these adaptive mutations are induced. I don't think he can do that. I'm honestly not even sure he's going to try. I think he might just sort of weakly imply some kind of Lamarckian evolution and then just leave it at that. Now, we're all adaptable. Did you notice that when Dr. Clary was speaking, he was running out of gas. That's because he had COVID and he hasn't fully recovered yet. Well, let's hope he was no longer contagious. He had, he had a really bad case of COVID. I thought he was going to really be sick and almost be with the Lord. I got COVID and I haven't fully recovered yet either. So both of us kind of like when we used to be able to talk on one massive breath, we're kind of gasping for air a little bit because neither one of us have fully recovered. Honestly, that sucks. I'm not here to wish ill health on either of these guys. This is what creatures are doing. What? Getting sick? Yeah, everyone is aware of that. We're trying to recover. We have an engineered adaptability. ICR has put together a model, a model which describes how, how organisms adapt. They continuously track what? The environment. It's a descriptive term. It's not magical, like natural selection. 
I still feel like we have in no way been shown how differential reproductive success in the context of specific environments is magical. I also feel like this model will not be well described. Or artificial selection. By the way, when people use a real brain and really select, evolutionists call that artificial. Uh, they get everything 100% backwards, 100% backwards. I have no idea what his point is or how artificial selection is backwards, but I do note that he's not rejecting its effectiveness. But that also means that differential reproductive success, which is what drives both natural selection and artificial selection, does in fact work to modify populations of organisms over time. So what prevents this level of adaptation to the environment from affecting reproductive success? It must be something, or natural selection simply emerges from the system, just like science says it ought to. And I want to talk about one specific area because I want to bring something new that even if you're a creationist veteran for 50 years, and some of you are here, something that you haven't heard before. That would be nice since as far as I can tell, creationism has been moving at a snail's pace to the point that Jackson Wheat can read a book from the 1960s by creationists, and despite being about 60 years old, it's basically all the same bad arguments as current creationist groups use. I want to talk about anticipatory systems. So systems which allow organisms to anticipate things in advance, or to put it in a very plain way, adapting today for tomorrow's challenges. Now this would be groundbreaking. If he could show a way that organisms can mutate to become adapted for new environments, both deterministically and before the conditions of those environments even occur, that would be hard to comprehend given current models of biology. That would require a radical departure from the current consensus, and frankly, I'd have a hard time coming up with anything but a higher power type thing that could be in charge of that. Although, there are a few other options, but most of them have similarly significant theological or spiritual implications. Now that is cool. That is really cool. Yeah, to put it very mildly, it is. But are we actually going to see his homework on this one? As a fact, that's so super cool, human engineers can't even really do it yet. There's a lot of cool things that human engineers can do, but they're not really good at this. So at one point, humans couldn't make heavier-than-air flying machines. That doesn't indicate that birds are or were magical. That humans cannot currently engineer a machine that does a particular thing does not say anything about the ability of evolution to result in a biological organism that can do that thing. Adapting when? Today for what? Tomorrow's challenges. Wow. That would really be cool, because this is answers what we ought to do, how we ought to do things. Now you see this young gal here, she's facing in a fork in the road. Should she go to the right or should she go to the left? You know what would help her make a decision? Is if she could see what? What's at the end of each path? But why are we spending time convinced that this is a cool ability? We all know that. There's a simple reason people get duped by psychics. It's because we all think that the ability to see the future or distant places or whatever is super cool. We're skipping any more of, gee, look how cool all organisms being psychic would be stuff. Because we get it. This is what anticipatory systems enable creatures to do. It's not, they don't get to see into the future, but they kind of anticipate what's coming up the road. They kind of like get to look over the hill. Oh, I get it. They don't see into the future. They see into the future, obviously. This makes total sense. So to speak, this is a really, really highly engineered and really cool mechanism. It sure would be, but I've yet to see any indication that it's a thing organisms can do. We went from organisms can sense their environment, which is true, to phenotypic plasticity, which is real, to organisms can use psychic powers to change their own genomes to adapt to environments before the environments even exist. I feel like we've skipped a few steps in getting to that last claim. Engineers tried to do this. In 2006, New Horizons, it's an interplanetary probe, was launched. Cape Kennedy. In 20, it, it, it circled multiple planets, circled around the Earth, picking up speed, circled other planets, picking up speed, and whoosh, was sent out towards the end of the solar system, and in 2015, rendezvoused with Pluto. How many miles away? Three billion miles. That's almost mind-boggling to imagine it. Okay, if you're playing creationist bingo, make sure you fill in the spot for big number. That's big numbers, people. We have big numbers. And it has to keep track of where it is, where Pluto is. The engineers at NASA kind of nudged it along the way. By nudged along, he means using rocket burns 
calculated by NASA scientists and engineers. There were five course corrections in getting to Pluto. New Horizons didn't calculate any of them. It doesn't have the capacity to do that. But still, is this an engineering marvel? <laughs> you hit Pluto three billion miles away many years into the future. That is anticipatory planning. I mean, I guess, but as far as I know, humans didn't have to alter their anatomy or genome to make it happen. They mostly use things like calculus and patched conic models, with some help from things like the rocket equation. New Horizons had no idea about any of this, and I'm still not seeing any reason to think that other animals can do similar things in order to change their genetic and physical makeup to pre-adapt to not yet present environmental conditions. And if that wasn't enough, it circled around Pluto, picked up some more speed, and flew out to 2019, another billion miles, and rendezvoused with a rock that was 22 miles across. Yep, following another set of similar course corrections. 22 miles across, 22 a billion. I mean, you're talking a fraction of a degree, and it rendezvoused with it. That is anticipatory planning. That is incredible type of planning. I don't want to diminish the amazing feats of engineering done by NASA or anything, but also, this second rendezvous was set up by another set of course corrections at various points. It's not like after leaving Pluto, it just so happened that Horizons was so well planned that it was on a direct intercept for its new target. You know what? Creatures can do the same thing. Here we have a, a little dragonfly. It wants to eat this moth. When it gets close enough, it doesn't just run down the moth and just by brute speed just overpower it. It makes a plan of where the moth is going to be. It plans out where it's going to be. And boom, it goes on an anticipatory trajectory and intercepts the moth. This is true, and it's one of the most amazing facts about dragonflies. Most flying predators do not eat this way. Most of them simply fly directly towards their prey, which if done fast enough will eventually mean that they are directly behind the prey, and since they're faster than the prey, if they can stay on target, like a Y-wing in the Battle of Yavin. Stay on target. We're too close. Stay on target. Loosen up! They'll eventually catch up and be able to snap up their food. Dragonflies, on the other hand, take into account the current velocity of their prey, as well as their capacities, and predict where to fly to most efficiently connect with their victim. This is similar to a human hunter targeting prey and leading them with his hunting rifle, because if he aims directly at the target, he will miss. But if he gives a lead, then the bullet and the prey will be in the same place at the same time, much to the detriment of the prey. Of course, since this is not what most aerial predators do, it raises the question of why not? And how is it a good example of organisms sensing future environmental conditions? since an insect flying is not a good indicator of future climactic shifts or such things. The same way that that interplanetary probe intercepted Pluto, and it's using the same mechanisms. I don't think that dragonflies are using radios to communicate with teams of scientists and engineers at NASA to get them to do calculations so that they can intercept their prey. Sorry, Randy. And this is what the paper shows. It actually doesn't show the mechanisms by which arthropods seem to be able to consider the future consequences of their actions, just that they can. It's actually a really cool and fairly short paper, and it's more of a survey of some literature than a reporting on a new experiment. My favorite experiment that the paper talks about is using a ladder with randomly spaced rungs, some of which would be removed also randomly as a grasshopper climbed the ladder. The grasshopper would climb the ladder only occasionally glancing back to check on its foot placement, which already means that the grasshopper must have a sense of its own positioning as well as a map of the environment and ability to map one onto the other. But impressively, when a rung was removed, the grasshopper would initially grab for the now missing rung, but then not finding it there, it would automatically, and without always needing to look, reach that leg for the next rung. All of this means that, even though we perhaps were taught in school that arthropods have no thoughts, and we're basically just robots with a large number of pre-programmed behaviors, this may not be the case. They seem to be able to learn, to some degree, to hold internal mental models of both themselves and their environment. What the paper doesn't indicate is that insects can somehow change their physiology or morphology in anticipation of future environmental conditions. Of course, the paper is linked in the description. By the way, I put all these papers in all of them. For those who are real purists, I want you to know what the scientific paper is that I got everything from in this particular case. I appreciate it. Quite a lot, actually. And this paper says this. Evidence of internal models in dragonfly behavior suggest use of a predictive model of the prey's trajectory and a copy of the dragonfly's own motor commands. This dragonfly with its tiny little dragonfly brain is making a predictive model. 
inside of it. Something that human engineers are struggling to do. Again, that human engineers struggle to make things does not indicate that they cannot come about from natural causes. These are not just reactive, these are proactive models. In some cases, like the dragonflies or the spiders of genus Portia, yes. In other cases from the paper, such as honeybees, ants, and grasshoppers, this is less clear. Which flow from a logic-based system. Logic-based systems, and when they're in creatures, they give creatures foresight of what they ought to do and how they ought to self-adjust to predicted external conditions which are coming. Right, like which way to fly to catch another flying insect. But remember, Randy is trying to argue that this ability somehow allows them to predict things like average temperature and rainfall in the coming centuries, and then somehow change their genetics to reflect these future conditions. And they may be coming the next day, they may be coming a month, they may be coming a year from now. We're going to need a f citation on that one, Galuzo. That paper in no way even hinted at the ability of any animal to predict conditions any more than a few minutes in the future. Pray tell, what stimulus is a dragonfly going to receive that will give it reliable information about conditions in a day, let alone a year? But they are giving these abilities to, like, forecast what's going to be happening and adjust today for those kinds of things. In other words, when creatures self-adjust and when they adapt, it is not just reactive, but it is incredibly proactive. Okay. It's time to talk about adaptation in nature and in the lab and why this is nonsense in some depth. Essentially, we're going to come up with predictions based on Dr. Galuz's ideas and see if any experiments have already addressed this. This is how science works. If Randy wants to be taken seriously as a scientist, this is what he should be doing. So we know that in a fairly short time, organisms can adapt to new environments, both in the lab and in nature. For example, flies in both nature and the lab can change significantly due only to a change in diet in a matter of months or years. Birds will change beak shape in response to climate and shifting availability of food. Bacteria will gain resistance to toxins or new metabolic pathways. Now some amount of this is in fact due to phenotypic plasticity, such as that which Dr. Galuza has already mentioned. But not all of it. And how do we know? Well, because we can check. In fact, that's largely what the whole Lensky long-term E. coli experiment is about. They keep records of the genetics of different populations of bacteria in a unique environment and have been looking at the different ways in which different populations have evolved. And it hasn't just been phenotypic plasticity. Their genetics are now significantly different from the wild-type E. coli. So let's see how a few different interpretations of the idea that organisms can forecast their environment might affect the experiment if the idea were true. Well, first, perhaps the bacteria could somehow foretell that they were about to go into a liquid citrate and glucose medium in which they'd be shaken each day. We might expect that they'd probably pre-adapt themselves to this by doing things like getting rid of their metabolically costly flagello, as is often seen in lineages in the experiment. We would also expect that they'd do some of the other things that have changed in the experiment right from the outset, like becoming hypermutators, or even gaining the ability to aerobically metabolize citrate, as happened in one group in the experiment. But this isn't what happened. The first few generations were essentially identical to the wild type, and we know because it's documented. It took years to develop all the currently existing strains with their various adaptations. We would also expect the fitness to only really increase at the beginning of the experiment and then more or less halt as the organisms have changed themselves to adapt to the environment they foresaw and which they presumably know would persist for what to them is the equivalent of millennia for humans. Instead, it has risen throughout the experiment, although it is doing so at a declining rate as the bacteria approach their local fitness maxima through time. Another option is that all of the change would have simply been down to phenotypic plasticity and that there would be no new genetic traits. And we see the fitness increase right at the start and stay high, and then not really change. Of course, we know that genetic changes did indeed happen and fitness rose over time, so this doesn't work. Last, perhaps the mutations are induced, but slowly and in anticipation of the new environment, and then even further while the bacteria persist in the environment. This would get us the fitness increase that we actually see in the experiment, but there is another problem. If these mutations are deterministic and in response to the environment, we would expect them to be essentially the same in all strains, since all the strains started as clones and are all in the same conditions. This is not the case here in real life. Well, perhaps adapting to a weird environment like a citrate glucose flask isn't a great test. Well then, let's travel back some 80 years or so to look at the Luria Delbrook experiment. This experiment was specifically designed to see whether mutations were the result of organisms responding to environmental changes, as Randy would have it, or if they were simply random. The experiment used antibiotic resistance, 
if mutations are the result of environmental stimuli, we would expect that different groups of bacteria of the same species would all develop resistance to the same antibiotic in the same concentrations at the same rate. After all, they are all nearly identical and exposed to the same environmental conditions, and before they are, there's not a particular reason to expect them to have mutations granting resistance if, as Randy would have it, such things are actually deterministic responses to the environment. So we should expect all the colonies to behave about the same with increasing amounts of antibiotic. Turns out, this is not what happened. Some colonies were nearly immune from the onset, others only gained resistance as the experiment progressed, and some never actually developed resistance. This means that mutations granting resistance arose before the experiment in some bacteria, during it in others, and never in yet others. This tells us that these types of mutations happen essentially at random, and are not tied to an environment in which they might be useful. Some fennec fox is just as likely to have a mutation that would make it well adapted to a human forest as it is to have a mutation that makes it better suited to its desert environment. But that's just how it is, and if that fox were lucky enough to end up somehow in such a forest against all odds, then hooray for it! It will be selected for over its kin that lacks such a mutation. But none of them will get the mutation in advance because they know they're off to a humid forest. And similarly, after getting there, their offspring will be no more likely to get mutations benefiting them in that environment than they would have been while still in the desert. In other words, we know for a fact that adaptations arise from changes in genetics, and that such changes happen as a result of mutation, and that such mutations are not predetermined or caused by the environment. Rather, they are stochastic. But with that, we're going to end this episode. I hope that I'll see you next time for the second episode, where we'll pick right back up here. If you like this video, please do hit like. If you didn't like it, hit dislike and tell me what you didn't like in the comments. Either way, please do subscribe to the channel. And if you haven't already, turn on all notifications so you're always notified when there's more Dapper Dino content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Landon Knoll, Yepetus, Mabdi Babdi, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if the annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.